everybody and welcome to another Time Team Tea Time Q&A session, uh, this time on Plangorse Lake, um, which created so many memories for all of us. And uh, I was really pleased to be able to talk with Damien Goodburn, who constructed that boat, and Carenza about the site. Um, it was a fascinating place and thank you for sending in your questions and, and for your very nice comments um, about um, the fact that you've appreciated us keeping um, these shows going uh, while we're all in various stages of, of lockdown or difficulty. Um, the questions I've got today, um, we'll go through them as Zoe proper. Um, Zoe asked, um, was there a follow-up investigation after Time Team left? Well, there was Zoe. Um, uh, the University of Wales with Mark Redknapp and Alan Lane went back there and they found all sorts of amazing things. Um, a few that come to mind was a reliquary, um, something which possibly contained the bones of a, a saint or perhaps a holy bell or something like that. Uh, an, an amazing, beautiful object, which you can see in the book and the article. They found wrapped up in the mud, a tunic, beautifully made, beautifully woven with silk in it and a, a Byzantine design. And this has been connected with Alfred. Alfred made a diplomatic present to the Prince of Brykiniog which is where Tlangorse was. And amazingly enough, they were able to um, untangle that bundle and see this rather beautiful tunic and link it to Alfred, which is fantastic. Um, and so all that subsequent excavation also revealed more of the structure, more of the oak timbers, the way the island had been constructed. And the more that was done on it, um, the more interesting and the more important I think it was likely to have been. Um, so moving on to your next question, um, uh, Linda um, L. Stinson says, terrifying to have so few findings. Um, did we, uh, did this happen a lot and did we have panic sessions in the evening? Uh, the answer to that is yes, we often did. Um, you know, by the end of day two, if nothing was coming out, very much we'd have to say really strategically what should we be doing the problem with trenches is that once you open them they've got to be dug properly and recorded um, you can't just sort of bounce around looking randomly all over the place so you've got to follow a strategy and within three days it was often um, touch and go but what was often very interesting is that by day three we quite often turned up something late on day three it was something about the tension of the moment, the concentration, uh, the push that everybody, the team made to get something. Um, but yes, I, I, I remember with a certain amount of terror moments of panic where I thought, well, we're not actually going to be able to find anything very much at all. Uh, the next question, um, again from Linda, Linda L. Stinson, uh, whatever happened to the boat? Well, you'll hear on my interview with Damien some fantastic details about that. Um, but um, the interesting thing about it was that in order to preserve it, the best thing they decided they should do is to actually sink it in the lake. And that boat was sunk in Tlangos Lake. And then in 2016, it was lifted. And the interesting thing was that um, it was preserved really well. Um, it had dried out and Damien made the point that those boats as they dry out become obviously lighter and therefore more manoeuvrable. And they found that that boat was capable of doing around three miles an hour and floated higher in the water than our version or the boat that we had that same boat in green oak, which is obviously quite a bit heavier. So um, Damien has some fascinating details on that. And, and the boat is still around. And um, it, it, Damien refers to that in the discussion I had with him. 
A um, couple of nice comments. Victor's drawings, yes, always a joy to see those. And Mix uh, regularly delivered adage that the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Um, that was one of those things I always, I often had a different view from Mick. He would be saying, oh, well, Tim, that's really interesting. We've dug those holes and there's nothing in them. And I'd be going, hang on a minute, Mick, I, you know, I'd slightly more prefer to find something. And he'd say, well, no, it's very interesting. There's nothing there. And uh, and we'd move on from there. But uh, yes, it, it was. A, it's an interesting thing that sometimes archaeological sites, it's useful to find out where things aren't rather than where they are sometimes. From a television point of view, it's not always quite so much fun. Um, Toby uh, J. France again refers to um, a slower pace, a smaller team. I think things did change. We did have more people. Uh, we could be more ambitious with the trenches as things moved on. We did, I think, gradually be capable of doing more in three days than, than we did in those, those early programmes. But I actually quite like the gentleness of the pace. Um, there's sort of less stuff coming out in a way, but it gives you a little bit more time with some programmes to be, I think, as Carenza pointed out, uh, elegiac, I think she called it, which was rather nice. If we'd have had more resources, what would we have done? Um, and I think probably, as I said earlier, we'd have looked at LIDAR surveys. We'd have probably done more underwater work around the periphery of the Cranog and spent a lot more time analysing some of the woodwork, I think, because all that material is absolutely fascinating. Toby again asks, geophysics has changed a lot um, and, and in general, did, was it faster or did John become more confident? I think jo John was able to um, uh, increasingly understand the relationship between the results he was getting from his machines, the software in the computer and his own understanding of sites. And certainly as radar, um, ground penetrating radar became more and more available, I think John was able to refine the work he did on Time Team. And as he always said, the beauty of that was that you did the survey and then within an hour or two, we would actually be excavating what he found or doing test bits on it, which allowed him to recalibrate the equipment. And I think we got better at that. Um, the results had come, go onto the computer, get them back, that got quicker. The relationship with the software and certainly as radar became more and more common and Jimmy Adcock um, was very much part of that um, we began to get more and more detailed results from geophysics although I'm always pleased to note that John will always say if you really want to find the condition of the things under the ground you still have to dig but yes I think it did the technology did improve um, Joe Walsh, uh, thank you for your kind comments, Joe. Um, uh, would we have done anything differently today? Well, we've, we've sort of answered some of those things already. Um, but I think as a site, um, I would like to have probably gone back again. There were a couple of time teams we did. Um, there was a Roman villa where we went back um, for another look. We also went back to Athelney. Uh, we did Athelney at the start and then we did it 20 odd years later. And I think I would like to have done that with Flan Gorse because I think Mark and Alan had found out so much. I would have liked to have done a retrospective program or a program where we went and looked at what they discovered because that tunic was really something. And one of the other things they found that I was very interested in was that they increasingly found evidence of burnt remains uh, that, that appeared to be a sign that that place had been deliberately destroyed. And we know historically that Ethelflaed, uh, the daughter of Alfred, who was really um, the Queen of Mercia, if you like, had sent a party, an army, to attack um, these areas 
um, and that this Clangorse was one of their targets. And evidence of that burning would have been fascinating to see. And I would also like to have seen the reliquy, the reliquy the clasp, difficult thing to say. Uh, when you read the articles and read the book, you'll see the richness. We, we began a process and we did really what we could do in those three days. Um, and I would love to have taken a longer look at it and possibly gone back. But as we've often said with Time Team, the problem is if you spend more and more time on one site, then there's other sites that don't get evaluated. And I hope what we did working with Mark and Alan was to move that site on a bit, bring our enthusiasm, bring Damien to do the boat. Um, I know they've got a lovely visitor centre there now, so it's well worth a visit. And I think it, it created a sort of a little bit of time team buzz around a site, which hopefully helped the project along. And the subsequent work that Mark did um, has been amazing. Often time team, you know, a, a burst of time team's enthusiasm and energy created a little bit of a start to a, to a longer process. And, and I think we might have been part of that. Um, and certainly the more they found about that site, the more that island in the lake, uh, which we think may have had royal connections now, became fascinating. And it always was an atmospheric site. Early in the morning with the mists rising, you'd look across the water and there you'd see this place where in the Iron Age people had been living and had created a home for themselves beyond the reaches, hopefully, of anybody who was attacking. Um, unfortunately, when Ethelfled Ethel sent the army in, uh, it didn't work, but it must have been a lovely place to have lived at one time and full of all that mystery of, of the Welsh legends about it. So I'm glad you enjoyed the programme. Thank you for sending in questions. We'll, we'll try and keep answering them. And I hope you stay well. And I look forward to talking to you after the next Time Team Tea Time.